Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Ticks, Season 2, Episode 13, with myself, Ryan. We got Sam and we got Jackson. Hey. Um, as ever, guys, please leave a like, leave a comment with uh, any kind of opinions that we've discussed today. And uh, please subscribe, hit the big red button, and uh, get notified for everything Trash Arts. On today's show, Sam is going to bring us up to speed with everything industry. There's some really cool news within that today. And then we're actually going to do a bit of a deep dive on David Fincher and um, what kind of makes his films unique and, uh, well, good, really. So without further ado, over to you, Sam. So Margot Robbie is replacing Emma Stone for Damien Chazelle's Babylon. This is a film about 1920s uh, Hollywood. Um, Damien Chazelle, like, obviously won all the Oscars, but not the big one for La La Land. <laughs> and then no one really liked First Man. No one really talked about it, didn't make much money. It was a bit of a low step, so he's going back to glitzy, probably musical moments. The cast already has Brad Pitt in it, which is pretty cool. So it's a reunion of those two for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And the rumour is that Tobey Maguire, Meryl Streep and Michael B. Jordan are joining the cast. What has Tobey Maguire been doing for the last few years? I think he mostly produces and works on eco things with... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Leo? Yeah. In other casting news, Hugh Grant has uh, teamed up with Charlie Brooker for a, a Netflix documentary called... Well, mockumentary, sorry. Death to 2020. Oh. This is apparently they shot this like last week. That seems like an odd team up to me. I mean, Hugh, Hugh Grant is sometimes he has comes, yeah. he has been doing a bit more edgy films. Yeah, yeah he's the edgy trained. one, the gentleman. Was yeah. he the gentleman? But this is it. Apparently, he plays quite a loathsome character, and it's a mockumentary. Uh. And he's been enjoying playing those characters, especially if he can, you know, have a little dig at the media because Hugh Grant knows what's going down. <laughs> Surprisingly, over, I think I said this before, but over time, he's got a lot more likable. Yeah, from his you know romantic, unlike yeah, his charming Britishness, yeah. <laughs> stereotypical. Uh, 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 <laughs> we we don't really know any more about it. I'm feeling like perhaps this could come out by the end of the year, or it's going to be a starter to next year. It's it's evidently going to come out very quickly. I know that the most of the world know Charlie Brooker because of Black Mirror, but for me personally, it's about New Swipe yeah. and Nathan Barley. So for him to go back to that kind of stuff. It's kind of exciting, so I'm looking forward to seeing what that's about. There's going to be another Van Helsing remake. <laughs> Although, in all fairness, I think there's actually been one Van Helsing. Nah, there's probably been more than one. Um, Julius Avery is going to direct, and he did that film Overlord with the Nazi zombies recently, which was actually oh. pretty damn good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was uh, you know, over the top. Nazi zombies is going to be over the top, mm. but, like, it, it, it actually really captured the sort of war essence. Yeah, of especially it. the first half of the film. Yeah, yeah. I feel like everyone went Nazi zombie crazy after, what was it, Call of Duty? Yeah. Well, you, you say that, but Nazi zombies are a, a staple of exploitation cinema. Nazis experimenting, and there's, there's loads of stuff like that. So it's like, it's interesting that they tried to make a mainstream Nazi exploitation film, and nobody went and saw it. Overlord did not perform well at all. But James Wan's producing this new Van Helsing. As I said before, the Universal Monsters, they're just coming up with ideas left, right, and center, and nothing's connected, and it could all be good. So I've got fingers crossed for it because I've always liked the idea of Van Helsing. It was just so cheesily done in that Hugh Jackman film from way back when. Yeah. 15 what, years ago. Five, yeah. Yeah, crazy, eh? Peter Dinklage has been cast in The Toxic Avenger with Macron Blair directing. Macron Blair did the film um, I Don't Want to Live Here Anymore. It's, uh, I think that's what it's called. It's a Netflix film of Elijah Wood. It's actually pretty good. It's, it's a random choice for a Toxic Avenger reboot. But at the same time, why not? People adore Toxie. They love it. Troma, unfortunately, they could keep producing sequels to it. But why not like, get a bit of recognition? Lloyd's going to get a bit of dollar. <laughs> <laughs> so Kaufman's all sorted for that. Something huge happened, and I, it's kind of weird because we were going to record this the day before, and I'm kind of happy that we didn't, that HBO and Warner Brothers have kind of done a game changer. Warner Brothers have decided that whole entire 2021 slate is now going to be available on HBO Max as well as theatres, aka Netflix. And although the world doesn't have HBO Max yet, the world's going to get HBO Max. Which personally, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've always wanted HBO. I love all of HBO's dramas, comedies, so I'm, I'm all for it. And also the industry's been in a, you know, a stagnant place where box office is supposed to be everything. 
and it never should have been everything because it's all about corporate buyouts of you know how many screens can buy this and it doesn't really give an opportunity for the other films well I, th I think this is an interesting um, point of how the how the industry is is dramatically changing and we've been saying over the last year how we think mm. that it's due a, a massive change and how um, COVID's going to facilitate that change um, and uh, I'm surprised it hasn't happened sooner to be honest I, I wasn't I, I wasn't too surprised about this news but at the same time I, I do think it, it can have a dramatic impact on the industry at large and whether that's positive or negative I guess we'll see yeah well, one thing that does worry me about it actually is is the monopolization of um, you know the fact that studios are owning their own VOD sites and uh, mm -hmm. obviously you know cinemas used to be owned uh, were owned by studios at one point and they had to stop that because it created too much of a monopoly so whether that will happen with the VOD industry as well I mean it's going to be difficult because um, you know Netflix have sort of set the precedent for this of, of you know becoming a studio from being a VOD site so whether it can work the other way around we'll, we'll see it's going to be a domino effect yeah. that's what I reckon is going to happen and finally this is our last week for our Indiegogo. Thank you massively to everyone who has supported us. Um, <clears throat> on Friday the 11th of December, that is our final day. So if you wish to support, you'll see the link on the screen right now. We will be sending films out straight away to festivals and of course sorting out our perks for everyone who has contributed. But yeah, thank you to everyone who's contributed so far. Hopefully it will make a strong year for these particular films next year. And we have a new trailer coming up. Tomorrow. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what you need to invest in, Sam? Thinking about it. What? A VPN. <laughs> <laughs> have you been? Have you? Are you receiving unpaid the paid sponsorship that we thinking, don't know yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that what you're? Like, Try some money. VPN, yeah. <laughs> I do things legally. That is legal. Yeah. It is legal. Yeah. So it's actually absolutely by the book. And then you could get HBO Max. <laughs> so, so I'll throw that in there um, <clears throat> if you would like to advertise your VPN through our podcast please just give us money please well, <laughs> I'm let, us, let us know first <laughs> <laughs> page content so this week guys we decided to continue our theme of the deep dive um, as we've done in the past and specifically we wanted to do a bit of a deep dive on David Fincher and um, what makes his films unique and uh, also what makes his films really good and enjoyable well that's down to whoever's opinion but yeah so I remember for me personally whenever I kind of was well growing up I remember I watched Fight Club and I think Fight Club is such a really interesting well film to start on with David Fincher simply because well the, the way that the whole premise is is that it's two people that obviously start this Fight Club and they have the rules and stuff to it but as the story starts to go on you start to understand that oh hold on a second it's Tyler it's, yeah. so Brad Pitt's character is actually just an alter ego of Tyler who's the main character who's played by we go Ed Norton and Brad That's it. it. Yeah. Um, and that, like, being, what, 10 years old when that came out, really kind of interested me. And I thought it was, well, yeah, just a, a very, very unique way of sort of showcasing two characters, which are actually one. I think a lot of films since then that I've seen do that, it's very interesting how they have that dynamic. Yeah, we're, we're in a bit of a twist-focused place with thrillers around 99 as well. You got, I think, like, Sixth Sense the biggest twist of them all and I, I find it weird with Fight Club that like everyone always fixates on that particular aspect of Fight Club or the fighting <laughs> whereas like for me as a film about <laughs> I don't know it's a manipulation of fascism because they are essentially setting up this like organisation who are going to create you know terrorism and although they paint it in the anarchy, anarchy sort of light it's more, you know, it's a crazy person. It's literally a crazy person listening to his own thoughts and then having an army. And that says a lot of, you know, we, we, that has obviously happened quite recently with Donald Trump and things like that. And it brings this horrible, toxic masculinity because it's such a, you know, it's just this real sort of militant man does this and you do this for the cause and it's almost cult-like. It brings up all these aspects. It's but, very cult-like. Yeah. People always get lost though with the the major twist at the end, and it is really well done. And you suddenly like, what the hell? 
It's only when you watch it several times you go, this is really obvious. It's very clear from the beginning. I think, yeah, but that, it, it's one of them type of films that whenever you watch it first time through, it leaves a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah, yeah. But then because when you watch it the second time through, you're looking for them, kind of, you're trying to spot the, oh, where did it go wrong or where is it showing you the blatant obvious that Brad Pitt is actually Ed Norton's mm. character and just an alter ego of him. And <clears throat> so it does start to become a bit more obvious. I think it also, it's got that kinetic filmmaking that um, you saw a lot in the 90s, you know, like fast editing or something a little bit strange, like when it goes into the kitchen to explain the wiring of how his flat's blown up and all that kind of stuff. I think a lot of that comes from the fact that David Finch has started in music videos. Yeah. He did stuff for Madonna. Um, I think he did some, some stuff for Aerosmith. It was all like the, the big over-budget videos that you saw at the beginning of like the 90s. He did some for MJ. Yeah, I think he did, yeah. So like, I think he brings a lot of that into his early films at the very least. I mean, Seven's, um, his film before Fight Club, which is just, you know, <laughs> morally fucked up. It's a very fucked up film. It's a very disturbing, strange film. Um, and if anything, you're right. Fight Club is a better place to start if you want to get into Fincher stuff because Seven's a heavy one, you know? Seven's, I think, yeah, Seven is definitely quite heavy, but I think one of the major aspects of Seven is that everything seems to be going like a stereotypical sort of thriller investigation film it's going to go the way of the, the detectives and then it gets to the end and it completely flips it on its head and you're yeah. like oh crap I did not see it end in this way like it's just doom and gloom yeah it's such a, an ending where you're like oh she so think oh they've nailed, him. they've nailed him they've, they've got like um, Kevin Spacey's character you know he's been found guilty almost they know that like he's the one that's doing it and stuff but there's that one last thing and you think they're gonna get away with it they're gonna you know bring him in and it's gonna be fine and dandy but it's just so horrific it's an interesting because it's obviously the entry to realizing that david finch has got a real fascination with serial killers most of his career he's been dotted around with either you know like tv projects or films in the sense of like zodiac and stuff and um from from reading about Fincher, like his dad was a journalist, so he's always had that interest in investigation itself. Mm. And yeah, it's 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 quite an extreme way to start with Seven being the way you want to like talk about that, you know. The thing that like that gets me about Seven is I think during the nineties, Brad Pitt was like hot property. Yeah, yeah. Very very hot property, and Morgan Freeman as well gives a really impressive performance. But like I say, it gets to a point where you're kind of rooting for the characters and you can't see it like going the other way but whenever it does it completely throws you and a lot of David Fincher films I think have that whole idea of, I know the journalism like Zodiac is massively about the journalist yeah, yeah. point of view um, but there's always that element that twist and it's it's I don't know, like, with Zodiac, you almost watch Jake Gyllenhaal's character and you're like, just fucking say something, just do something, yeah. like, stop being a car, try and move this forward, and he just doesn't, and you find more frustration in that um, than actually, yeah. Well, that's the thing, Zodiac is a film about frustration because there is no result. There yeah. is no confirmed case of who the Zodiac killer is. That is based on a real... Like a yeah, yeah, Zodiac Killer was a real killer around the 70s and stuff, and yeah, all those people, it's, it's their lives and the fact that they just never got to the answer of it, which is, I know that's a difficult thing as a film to, you know, watch. People don't like to watch frustration. They don't like to watch the idea of there being no result. And I find personally with Zodiac as a film that you, you re-watch a good couple of times and you go, oh yeah, it's definitely that guy. But that might be, again, the more cinematic intent to drive you towards that guy because that's who Fincher thinks is the one who um, did it. It's hard to know. But it's, again, it's a film that's just about frustration. It's not really about much else. But I think it works in that. Like, like I say, with Jake Gyllenhaal's character, he, um, he's always on the edge of like saying something or going that extra mile, and he just doesn't do it. And then by the time he does do it, it's too little too late and then nothing yeah. can be done about it and it's kind of quite tragic to see the way that his character just delves into this um, this realm of you know obsession and just wanting to find out who it is because he didn't take his chance the years prior the life starts crumble basically don't yeah. they? and that's, that's, a, that's another thing that Finch actually seems to be quite obsessed with is obsession mm. and how it just kind of crumbles you to pieces with um, Zodiac as well, there's that scene where he thinks he's in the place with the killer. 
and the guy's like you have to come upstairs and see this like old cinema reel and, and you know, for a second he's terrified and this and you're like is this going to be it because i suppose at any moment that you're investigating you're not a cop you're just a citizen detective you're just someone who's very interested and wants to know more i mean he's a cartoonist isn't he but yeah but yeah he, he does the cartoonist and the paper doesn't he so that danger is always there again not knowing who the killer is you you as a as a viewer are kind of expecting some sort of twist to go oh maybe actually it's this guy but it's not about that it's not about twisting anything it's about going this is what they experience who's the killer it's kind of about putting all the facts onto the table um throughout a you know a, a like a deep dive detective sort of yeah. investigation i can't think of the right way to say that but yeah and putting everything on the table and letting the audience then kind of figure it out for themselves and come away with their own interpretation of it like it does heavily lean towards it's the guy who his house he goes to and yeah, yeah. in the basement but then there's other stuff that then happens after that that kind of defuncts it and well this is what i've got from it anyway and um, kind of defuncts it and then you kind of sort of thinking well he is the, the dude whose house he goes to just a little bit on the crazy side and everything like in terms of evidence point towards him being the guy but yeah. then at the same time there's other stuff that debunk that and yeah it, I, I watch a lot of documentaries and watching zodiac i remember i watched it for the first time a few months ago and um, me and you spoke about it, Sam. Yeah. Just how within it, it's it's very like a documentary. In a documentary, will give you all the facts and stuff, all the stuff that has been taken from an investigation. It doesn't always give you the answers and like the conclusion to what that investigation was. And you then have to try and piece it together. Yeah. You come away from Zodiac like, oh well, it could have been this guy, and you start conducting your own investigation. It's like, what happened there, and you know. Is it going to be looked into again, et cetera, et cetera? It's just really interesting. I actually love cinematography in Zodiac as well. Some of the shots are just stunning, especially like the opening ones um, where the first two people are killed in the car. And they, they show you a silhouette of the man and you can kind of get in your head if you've seen the film a few times, oh, that's a silhouette of the guy later in the story. By the time you don't think about it... Is that on the ridge? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, like the, teens. The, the lover's ridge kind of thing. I think Finch is a very precise director, yeah, he's all about perfection and that's why every shot in it is so well timed or, or you know, like lit perfectly. He's a very cold kind of guy, he's, he likes his blues, lots of colours, like it's always a very blue kind of setting. You know, especially in his um, things from 2010, so you're talking like Social Network, Girl, Dragon Tattoo, Gone Girl, they all have a very similar kind of colour palette. And again, it's his stage where he brought in Personally, my favorite, one of my favorite bands in the whole world is Nine Snails with Trent Reznor. There's a particular sound now to Fincher's films that wasn't there in the uh, 2000s or the 90s, and it's created more of that particular Fincher style. <laughs> it's very industry, industry, industrial. It is. There, there's a very. That I think again, that's why a lot of people don't always connect with Fincher. Is is that slight coldness and not big answers? It's not. It, it might examine certain things, so like The Social Network is, to, to me, an incredibly important film. But for a lot of people, they could easily go, what was that really about? To me, it's about class, it's about wealth, and it's about what we have became as a society. But because it's wrapped in Facebook, and it doesn't have an ending, because, you know, this was like the 2000s up, leading up to the point that Mark Zuckerberg didn't even show his ugly face until a lot later on, you know? It's, it, the Social Network is a very interesting one, because... It, it it almost does a bit of a, a deep dive into what greed can do to someone. Yeah. Um, if you think in the in the film, when Justin Timberlake character comes in, it almost kind of taints Zuckerberg. Um, and then you have Arnie Hammer's character basically get screwed over. I remember the first time I watched that film when it came out, and I actually honestly believe Arnie Hammer and... Um, it, like the twin were yeah, actually yeah. twins and you know, they were like two separate actors and it wasn't until I seen them in something else like after that and I was like oh look it's one of the twins it's like you do realise it's the same actor it's weird how they did that because they yeah. literally just put like his face on the other guys the, the actor who's playing the body double you know he had to do all the scenes with him and then obviously they had to do it the other way around as well there's kind of a bit of that happening like in a lot of other films the one that stands out is Captain America where they did that well that's what I mean like they with what I liked about the fact when they did Social Network is it wasn't a gimmick. It was just to give that real... Because they're such horrible characters. They're two rich boys from privilege 
who think because they're bigger they should go and beat up the guy but they won't do certain things because of they're Harvard men even though they're like trying to screw over the guy in the first place because they have no technological knowledge they just see as we can make a Facebook for private for Harvard so it's elitist yeah. fitting into that mould and Zuckerberg sees that and goes I'm going to take that idea and build on it and make it bigger because the whole thing with his character is that he's desperate to be in Relevant. a club yeah he's, he's desperate to be part of the elite and he's not because of his personality he's, he's such an arsehole he doesn't have that likability of it but I don't think he doesn't disconnect with the fact that likability and success don't go hand in hand. You know, you could be a dick and still make a lot of money. I think that's kind of where the film sort of leads it towards. I think it's it's interesting because from experience, if I've watched a film about any kind of let's say um, someone who is well skilled, well qualified in something that like they're building something or in data, something like that. So he's effectively a programmer. Yeah. Um, but there's never the same sort of similarity as what his character has to the other films that I've seen where there's that element of greed and that element of social status that they want to become involved but they're willing to cut corner usually that's not really in their mind they just want to do something because they're good at what they do I don't know I think there's all it's all part of it it's like um, Wall Street the Oliver Stone film it's about class building as well as making the money and being the success and so yeah, yeah, there's always the element of success but what I'm saying is, is that like if you think about Wall Street films yeah like there's always that element of greed where you know they're salesy they, they're trying to do it for their own self interest and stuff Mark Zuckerberg in that is doing that for himself but in a lot of other films I've seen the techie dude doesn't always seem to have that same like um, personality traits it's their greed they just do it for the sake of wanting to do something that yeah. is, is theirs in well, essence again that kind of is like the right light because guess what not everyone in Silicon Valley is going to be doing it for the right reasons yeah. there's going to be all that greed and stuff and it's the first film that truly examines that in like you know the younger generations of who's becoming the next billionaire and I think that's really interesting and again people really slagged off the fact that Mark Zuckerberg was seen as too much of a nasty guy in the film 10 years later <laughs> and people are kind of like well that's, that seems like that was the right guy and there's a reason why he was a bit upset by the performance I think it's interesting that how quickly the social network came out compared to when Facebook and stuff became international so you think I think it was the early noughties where Facebook started going live um, like mid noughties and five years later you're talking about the film coming out well that's the thing honestly people thought it was a gimmick when it came out they thought it was just going to be about the birth of Facebook but the guy who wrote it Aaron Sorkin who um, did the Chicago 7 that recently came out he obviously had bigger ideas of what he wanted to discuss and I think it was about that idea of privilege that idea about wanting to be head o- um, head alpha in like the frat boy fraternities and how it just kind of carries over because as soon as they do get business interested the first thing they do is they cut out his friend who's been there since the beginning yeah and it's so nasty and that, the character Justin Timberlake plays like I don't know when you're trying to do anything you meet people who boost you so much that you think oh maybe it's right to go with them and just ditch everything else and he played it so well that you just you could see every little mechanism of this is when I pitch this this is when I pitch this and even like um, what's his face character um, I can picture him Spider-Man What's his name? Oh, Andrew, Andrew Garfield. Yeah, Andrew Garfield's character when he's like going through and then he went through this and then he went through that and it just felt so... You, you, it's easy to be in that situation where someone's like, I can make you a billion and all I'm going to do is take the away from Facebook because that's all he did. Yeah, the Facebook. <laughs> can you imagine that in the holidays? Like, the trash arts take away from the... <laughs> that's how we made our money. <clears throat> See, so moving on from that, like... The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo is obviously um, an adaptation of a book. Yeah. But it was also a remake from... Was it like a... It's either Swedish or Norwegian. I think it's Swedish. Yeah, it's definitely Scandinavian. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so I've never seen the original. So do you want to tell me a little bit? Have you seen the original? I've not watched the original. Um, the thing is, like, from what I get with that series is that the books are more popular than the films. Yeah. And they were really popular books and problem with the girl dragon tattoo is it's a good film it's a great film but it had so much expectations to be the launch of the next big franchise and it yeah, didn't do it didn't it. really take off and Fincher had a lot of fights with Sony and that's why they made sure for the sequel that he had nothing to do with it 
And um, Daniel Craig said he'd only do it if Fincher was doing it, and hence why they weren't invited back. It's a film that doesn't do anything. It's a very, again, very cold film. It's one of those more cold, calculated investigations that doesn't have the full excitement, but it's still good. But that's, that's kind of where Fincher, I suppose, is elevated um, in and amongst other directors, is that he can take a very, let's say, mundane story and turn it into something captivating. So if you think about like Zodiac, like it, it's interesting, but it's very linear. The, the social network, yeah, yeah. again, there's no real resolve at the end of that. Um, <clears throat> and I think with the dragon, the girl with the dragon tattoo, it had the the potential to be something, yeah, yeah, bigger. But well, I think that's where um, Gone Girl comes in quite nicely because Gone Girl is going to lead most, into that. <laughs> it's his most ridiculous film. It's a brilliant film. I love it, but it's so high concept. It's more of a high concept thriller where reality takes a little bit of a backseat for a bit of a, you know, mystery, who, what's going on. It's a lot of fun. It's more comical than anything he's done before as well. It is. Like, I think where Gone Girl is really, really good is it gets you thinking, oh, this, could this potentially happen? Like, if someone was that way, that way inclined, could this happen? And, like some of the stuff that ends up happening because for the first part of the film you're literally there thinking okay maybe Ben Affleck did kill his wife and why is he defending himself like we've seen that he's cheated and stuff like he doesn't seem like a good guy and then it completely flips and then you see everything from her perspective um, and yeah it just I, whenever I watched it I, I was not expecting that and then yeah, you yeah. see the, the trickery at the end of how she manipulates him for and they're both not nice people no. but you actually do feel sorry for Ben Affleck's character in the end like, he's done bad things don't get me wrong but he didn't kill her no. whereas she staged this whole murder and killed someone and then manipulated him in the end it's really really malicious um, and it, yeah I, like I just think it's an excellent sort of um, film for I suppose subvert an expectation yeah no I totally agree and again it's like like the other films it's talking about that sort of what's the right word um, status mm. because they're like upper middle class and she suppose she's like the daughter of from the book no she writes those books doesn't she yeah. so she has a certain persona and that's why at the end she comes back and is like we should just be together because right now we've got all the media attention on us and we need to be the smiley happy couple but inside he's like I just want you to go away well she basically says you've got to have a baby now yeah yeah and you're just like this guy's stuck and that's where the film leaves you and it's, it is a weird film that flips it where you think you're with this guy that's not particularly likeable but it's his story and really it's her story yeah she but completely it, takes back everything that she's wanted you know the way that it ends is the way that it starts yeah yeah and it, it kind of it um, I can't remember if it does it at the end but I know at the start they have that monologue don't they where he's basically stroking her hair and he's saying like if you ever like uh, it wasn't love someone but you ever um, cared enough about someone or whatever and you had thoughts to kill them and like that sets it all up that yeah, he's the yeah. killer but then it twists it um, and then the ending is effectively the exact same sort of thing um, yeah and I, I just I think it's a brilliant piece of cinema it's a classic thriller it feels like a, like a like, um, like a 90s thriller you know it's, it's got the entertainment there it's got all the beautiful cinematography and the great acting and it does feel like one that it's, just, it's a more mainstream film as well from what Finch has been doing around that time mm. which of course then leads up to Mank Mank because he tried to get films done you know there's lots of films he tried to get made but Finch was a difficult person to work with apparently well at least from a studio perspective because of his the way he likes to you know build the budget up to get what he wants with his hundred takes per shot and stuff. So, out of curiosity, we, we we're going to sit down and watch Mank, um, but is this one of the ones that he's um, done through Netflix with this deal that he signed? Um, it is, but Mank is also a film that he, uh, basically his dad wrote the original screenplay in the, the, the 70s and 80s. Cause it's all about Orson Welles and the creation, and the writer and the conflict of the creation of uh, Citizen Kane. So he originally was going to do it in uh, the, the 90s with Kevin Spacey, but it collapsed. And it kept collapsing, and he just at a certain point in his career went, no, nope, this is never going to get made, and just kind of rejected it. But then it got later on, and he was like, no, I need to make this film. It's something that I want to do. I suppose it's a tribute to his dad. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's that thing of the, the conf conf confliction of art versus commerce. Because, if, you know, there, it was not an easy ride for Orson Welles to what to do Citizen Kane 
so I think it's interesting it's gone back to that again it's a uh, it feels more like a personal piece, a, a bit of an anomaly outside of the other films, because the other films, except from Zodiac, they don't really feel that personal to Fincher. They're more like things he's thinking about as opposed to, like, things that have affected him, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, well, hopefully he hasn't experienced something like Seven. And that was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be a little bit crazy. Report that stuff. Um, there's probably a few films we haven't actually mentioned. Um, Alien 3. Yeah, he considers it his worst film. He hated making it. The studio treated him like shit. And that's why he made Seven. And The Curious Kiss of Benjamin Button, which I actually really like. I haven't seen it in ages, but I really like that film. I just found it twee. And for someone who's... For Fincher's style, like, I was just like, this is just a romantic drama with weird special effects. It's an interesting take on a love story. Yeah. Like, it, it, it's going backwards. I know there's... If you think of um, lots of different films, try it with using time and how time sort of goes against mm. um, <clears throat> and uh, I suppose the most recent one is like inversion within Tenant and um, yeah and I, I just love that element of you know time is always against you but yeah, how can yeah. you make it work within the time frame that you're given mm. and yeah Curious Kiss Benjamin Button's just beautifully made in my opinion I think it's brilliant and um, yeah I can't really think of anything else there's also the game. The game's a good little thriller from 97 in between Fight Club. Uh, it's about like Michael Douglas' character who's been put into this scenario where he thinks someone's trying to kill him, but it's all a big game, but is it a game? And it's the game. Yeah. It's Maybe a little bit too obvious. Yeah, it's a good like, game. <laughs> they, they, they probably shouldn't have called it that because it made the thing go, oh, okay, I know where this is going. Um, <laughs> did Panic Room? Yeah, and Panic Room's... Um, it's all right. Again, it's about... It's another class film because it's a richer class hiding inside a panic room whilst they're trying to rob it. It just feels a bit soft and nothingy. Mm. And I think um, what's his face in it, Jared Leto, and he was annoying, as always. He does do some good films. Fight Club, yeah, and uh, Requiem for a Dream. Yeah, yeah, that's the peak time when he was good though. Yeah, <laughs> the late nineties. Not a um, drug lord yeah, kind of yeah, joker. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and like the final thing I would probably say about Fincher is you mentioned it before about the um, the difficulties people find it quite difficult to work with him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I only realised this recently, but he, he was signed on to do World War Z two. Yeah. And then there's been sort of trouble within that. Um, but yeah, other than that, guys, thank you for listening. If you have a favourite Fincher film, please leave it in the comments. Let us know uh, what film it is and also why. And uh, please leave a like if you like what we did today. Also, subscribe, hit the big red bell to get notified for everything Trash Arts. And like I said, we got a new trailer, Decline, coming out tomorrow. So yeah, keep hit the bell so you can get notified of that. Uh, but other than that, guys, thank you very much for listening. Trash Arts take out. Ta-da. Bye.